Thank you very much indeed, Jill. So I'm going to hand over to Keith, uh, and uh, we're delighted to have you, Keith. You might tell us a bit about how it's, how it's, what it's like in America, first of all, at the moment. We're horrified to hear the stories of people dying there, to be honest. Ooh. Yes, uh, where we are living, thank the Lord, it hasn't hit us as severely as other parts of the country. So people in our area, we don't know anyone personally that we know has had the virus. Now, there are some who've been ill, and so they may have had it, but it wasn't severe with them. It didn't require hospitalization. I did have a friend and a brother in Christ go to be with the Lord about a week ago uh, in Tennessee. And he was a man in his uh, late 60s. He had Parkinson's disease, and he also had problems stemming from his old life. Before he was saved, he was a cocaine addict, and he had lifelong physical disability as a consequence of how he had lived before he knew the Lord. But anyway, some of you know of uh, my friend and brother, Henry Sardinia. Henry Sardinia went to prison as a believer at one stage and had to pay for things he had done before he was saved. And while he was incarcerated, he led this man who was also named Henry to the Lord. So that's the only person I know personally who's died. However, over in New Jersey, which isn't that far away, just a couple hours drive, and New York, a couple hours drive, uh, much more severe. And we've heard of a few distant acquaintances over that way that have died, mostly older people. Um, so everybody here is quarantined except essential businesses. And so as we, we get out to walk our dog like once a day, and it's amazing the opportunities you get to speak about the Lord, where before people didn't want to talk about the Lord. This, The only time I can think of that was somewhat like this was after the 9-11 attacks um, almost 20 years ago. People were so shook up then that anywhere you went, they wanted to talk about the Lord. They wanted to talk about the gospel. Uh, it was very relatively easy to witness in those days. And that lasted about a year. So... We'll see what happens with this, what the Lord has, but we're finding out a lot of opportunities for people to share Christ. And even my wife went to the chiropractor the other day, and he has never expressed any interest in the things of God, never asked me any biblical question, and yet he wanted the link to my YouTube channel so he could listen to my Bible teaching. So the Lord's doing things through it, and... A lot of assemblies, I'm kind of like the Chinese takeout or fish and chip shop for a ministry because different assemblies are saying, well, Keith, you're home. Why don't you record some messages on this subject for us or on that subject? So an assembly in Nassau, Bahamas, where Mark Lacey goes, I'm doing part of the book of Romans for them right now so that they don't fall behind on their Bible study. And I'm doing First Peter for two other assemblies and... Everything I'm doing, I keep uploading to my YouTube channel so anybody can go and can see it. So we're trying to stay profitable for the Lord during this time, and I'm literally preaching seven days a week. So uh, it's been it's been good for me, but busy. So I appreciate your prayers as I study the Word and prepare and preach that the Lord would use it. Uh, in any case, can I get on to the Word? Is that a sufficient intro? Okay, good. Very good to see you all and uh, miss you all. We'd love to come over more frequently, if that were possible, but, uh, you know, there's some time and distance that's involved. So we do pray for you regularly, though, so we're glad to see you. And really glad to see Brother Yule, because I'm often emailing him, and he's emailing me literally uh, every week we hear from one another, and sometimes daily. So it's nice to, to put the face with the man, uh, although I don't know he feels the same way about me, but there you are. Second uh, Samuel 24, Second Samuel 24, and verse 17 is what I want to read. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Surely I have sinned, I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. Now, that statement actually comes after the Lord relented, it says in verse 16, and said to the angel who was destroying the people, it is enough, now restrain your hand. And 
after David cries out like this, the Lord sends God the prophet, who then tells him to build an altar at the threshing floor of Aravna, as they say in Israel, but Aruna, as we say in our English translations, or sometimes you'll see Ornan. These are all possible spellings. But anyway, this man's threshing floor was to be purchased and to be used as a place of sacrifice, and that's what would stop the plague. Now, you know the story. David had sinned in numbering the people, as he confessed in verse 17 quite uh, readily. He was one that admitted his sin. And in thinking about the pandemic that's going on right now, so many people have said things to me like, is it for sin that this pandemic has come? Is God sort of hitting us with a plague because of our personal sins? And I think, of course, that people have somewhat of a short-sighted view of the world. They forget that God is the God who sends the good things as well as the bad. So the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 5, for example, that he causes his son to shine on the just and the unjust and makes it to rain on the just and the unjust and so forth. So we see the providential mercies of God. And Paul would later remind those in Iconium of the same thing in Acts 14, that he left not himself without a witness in that he gave the seasons and the different crops that come up and so forth. So so often when the world is going somewhat normally, as we think, we, we forget that God is behind those good things. But then sometimes when something like this happens, the world suddenly stops and they say, wait a minute, uh, why is this happening? And it's really short-sighted because the Bible is quite clear. The world is not as it ought to be. It is not the way God created it. When he created it, he could stand away from it and look back on his work and pronounce that it was very good. And of course, we know what happened after that, Genesis 3, the fall, that man brought sin into the world. And Romans 5.12, commenting on that, says, By one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And so we see that we're living in a world where death is ubiquitous, where it's everywhere. Where one out of every one person that we know of dies. I know there's a couple exceptions in the Bible, thankfully. Enoch being one in Genesis 5, and Elijah being another in 2 Kings chapter 2. But we know, of course, those are the outliers. Those are the exceptions to the rule. We know Hebrews 9.27 is still true. And as it is appointed once for a man to die, but after this the judgment. Now another thing that is short-sighted is wanting to look at something bad that's happening like the pandemic and saying, this is for my sin individually. I'm a liar, so God has brought the pandemic to sort of slap me around. Or I'm an adulterer, or I'm a thief, or whatever the person's besetting sin or sins are. But the Lord Jesus, in talking about calamities that happened in his day, he spoke about that tower of Siloam that fell on those men. And he said, do you think that they are worse sinners than the rest? And of course, the answer was no. It wasn't that the Lord uh, chast or judged these people uh, because they were more exceedingly sinful than others. In fact, sometimes the places that are more exceedingly sinful, the Lord leaves them go on for longer. So he pronounces the woe against Capernaum and against Bethsaida and against Chorazin for seeing the signs that he did. And he tells them that in the judgment, when that judgment day comes, our Lord's great white throne, that it would be more severe for them and less tolerable for them than it had been for Sodom. So we can't look at something negative, something bad, something that hurts people and automatically equate it to personal sin. But there are cases where our sin does bring consequences, and there are cases where our sin results in divine chastisement. And rather than look at the sin of the world and think that this is judgment by God for the sin of the world, because it seems to be a very blunt tool if God wants to do that, and God isn't judging the world yet. He's going to judge the world one day in righteousness, 
by the man whom he's ordained. And he's given assurance of this and that he's raised him from the dead. That's what Acts 17 tells us. It's our Lord Jesus. The Father has committed all judgment to the Son that all may honor the Son as they honor the Father. And the Lord one day is going to judge evil. But this isn't the day of his judgment. This is the day of his long suffering. This is the day of his mercy. This is the day of his compassion. So even in pandemics, the Lord is calling out to people, saying, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is the Lord is telling people, Come to me and drink of the waters of life freely. And the Lord is offering himself to this world. And even in this time where people's illusions of security are being shattered, the Lord is telling them, Come to me. There's no other rock like God. There's no one like our God. He alone is our rock. And so we think about how good God is, that even in these times, he's reaching out to people and saving people, and people that otherwise wouldn't pay attention to God are thinking about God suddenly. But as I thought about this plague that came about directly due to David's sin, I love David's attitude, that David looks at the people that are dying and he has compassion. And he not only confesses his sin, but he says, But these sheep, what have they done? And I thought, that's a lovely picture of David's great descendant, our Lord Jesus Christ. That our Lord Jesus is the good shepherd. How is the good shepherd defined? Well, in John 10, I am the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. We sing that sometimes, don't we? We'll sing of the shepherd that died that died for the sake of the flock. His love to the utmost was tried, yet firmly endured as a rock. David looked at the people that were dying, and he said, these are sheep. These are people that I was supposed to shepherd, and I've failed in a singular fashion. Don't let the judgment fall on them. Let it fall on me and on my house. And of course, God then sets up a way that David can end the plague, that David can send life. It's by sacrifice. And we think of our Lord Jesus Christ, who didn't do the sin, who couldn't say what David said, that I have sinned, that it's my transgression. No, he would say, this is the sin of the world. These are the transgressions of all these people that I've created, that have fallen, that have gone away from me, that have rebelled. And yet, I will go to the cross And I will lay down my life as the sacrifice for them. I will be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so the Lord Jesus, although he's holy, and although he didn't deserve to be judged, he doesn't stand aloof from sin or from any of the consequences of sin. He goes and pays the penalty for it himself on the cross. And he rises again to give us that tremendous hope that he's the one who now beyond death has brought resurrection. He brings life and immortality to light through the gospel, and he provides the hope of the resurrection. Now, what do we say then in these times we're living in? I would say to people, well, it's worse than you thought in one sense, and yet in another sense, it's better than you thought. It's worse than you thought because even if you get sick with COVID-19, whether you live or die, there are things worse than dying. The Lord Jesus said, fear him that when he has taken our lives, he's able to cast body and soul into Hades. And so there's a judgment to come. The bigger problem is not some virus. The bigger problem is sin. And that has to be dealt with. But it's better than you thought too, because we're not looking for a vaccine. We're not looking for a cure. I'm not saying about COVID-19. I do pray for a vaccine and a cure. God being merciful, if he wants to provide that to scientists and let them figure out, that's fine. But I'm saying for the bigger problem, we're not looking for medicine, we're not looking for a vaccine, because the cure, the solution, has already been provided in the Lord Jesus Christ. And because the Lord Jesus has risen, as he said, because I live, you shall live also. So that's the wonderful thing, that in times when everybody's talking about death, We can say, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he's living, whatever men may say. 
I hear his voice of mercy. I see his hand. Uh, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. Well, I trust you found it to be so, dear saints, that he's near. And you find that he has that shepherd's heart, that he's the one, even when he comes in glory in the millennial kingdom, after he's come to the church and after the tribulation, when he comes in the millennium, Isaiah 40 tells us he's the one who carries the lambs in his bosom, near to his heart and in his strong arms. And that's how he's going to carry us through as well. So thanks be to God for the good shepherd who loves the sheep and who proved that indisputably by giving his life for the sheep and also proved his ability to save and to take us all the way home to glory by rising again from the dead. So thanks be to God. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Keith. Uh, Thank you, Keith. We really appreciate that. Uh, I know you're a busy man and... um, we are, when you said you've been preaching seven days, it's